I'd like to welcome everybody to our Tuesday night class at Bejuro and welcome all our Torah Anytime viewers. Uh, today's topic is going to be uh, the power of money. Last week we spoke a little bit about charity, and today we're going to speak about money. Everybody wants money. Um, I haven't met one person, actually I have, I have met the few select righteous few that shun away from money. They don't want money, they don't want to deal with money, but the majority of people want money. No difference, Jew, Gentile, religious, secular, everybody loves money, everybody wants money. So, B'zat Hashem today, the goal is to understand a little bit on, on uh, the, the depths of money. What makes people go crazy over money? Um, and maybe we could also give little hints and, and little tips on some skulot to make you have money. And those will be spread out throughout the entire Shi'u uh, B'zat Hashem, as well as at the end. Okay, so the, the first thing is, is that the giver of money is God. Nobody else besides God is the one that gives money. So if we want money, we have to know how are we going to be able to get money from God. Not from your boss, not from your business partner, not from any possible business transaction, but rather everything comes from God. Now, the, the, there's a saying in America, time is money. Anybody know where this, who was the first person that said this? This saying comes from Benjamin Franklin, right? Benjamin Franklin, if you don't know him, he's on every $100 bill, right? He is on every $100 bill and he says, uh, <clears throat> except for the forfeit of uh, you know, the ones that uh, people make in the black market, who knows what they put over there. But anyways, uh, they, they have, uh, um, it's, it, he was one who said it. What, what does it mean time is uh, money? Which means is that if you have time, you should spend it making money. And if you're not making money, then that means you are losing money because you you're losing the time. So the way the, one of the forefathers of America, the founders of America, what was his wise words? Spend your life making money, right? And now, uh, whatever, I'm paraphrasing, right? He says, make, uh, uh, time is money. But in essence, if somebody, let's say, has three months to live, if let's say, God forbid, whatever, somebody has a few months to live, and some big fancy doctor comes over to him and says, listen, you are very wealthy. Every hundred, uh, every million dollars that you give me, I'll give you another year of life. I'll have a special medication, I'll give you another mil uh, year of life. Is this guy gonna even hesitate to give over, if he has three months left to live, he'll pay it over, no problem, the million dollars. Right? And you'll pay it off, and you'll pay it off. In fact, this guy will give many, many years in advance as well to, give, uh, to, to make sure that he lives. Here we see that what? That time is valued more than money. Right? And in essence, most people, really time is valued more. Right? You have all these people that are, are very wealthy and they're, they're well on in the years. If you ask them if you have any regrets, usually the main regrets that they all have, and they made a lot of money, is I should have spent more time with my family. I'm not talking about Jewish or religious or secular, I'm just talking about in general. Right? I would, I would uh, uh, wish I would spend more time with family. Everybody says the same thing. And yet they go and they chase money and they non-stop going uh, after money their, their whole life. Everything that they do is all focused on money. There is a, um, a funny thing that uh, I heard from Rabbi Daniel Mechanic. He, he, he uh, switches things around a bit. It says, Ashloshot varim ha'olam omed al kesef Al money, val gelt, which the translation means that the world stands on three things: money, money, and money. There's uh, the 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 Pirkei Avot that says that the three things that the the world stands on: the Torah, the Dag, Milot Hasadim. But he switched it around that the world runs on money, and I think he is right on target. Right? You look at everything that happens in the world, whether it's from politics, whether it's uh, pe people love to help people, medicine, right? People get into uh, become doctors, right? Why do they become doctors? Of course, they have a good heart and they want to help people, but at the end of the day, it makes a big paycheck. And if it wouldn't make a big paycheck, it would probably be something like a lawyer or a judge or something else. So at the essence, everything that talks is money. Money is the thing that, that talks at the end. And not only that, is money makes people do crazy things. There are so many cases in the news, unfortunately, you have Ponzi schemes. Right? Ponzi schemes is where people go and say, listen, I'll take your money and don't worry about it, I'll invest it. And what the person does is instead of investing it, he either goes and pays off other investors and say, oh, I made some uh, high dividends on your money, or he goes and uses it on his own to buy an extra yacht. Right? Completely stealing. And the people go and they get caught. And what happens, they sit for 7 to 15 to, they, this is a Ponzi scheme, they could sit a long time. Uh, if, money, for, if somebody murders somebody in America, they get a certain amount of years. But if they steal money, forget about it. They get a lot more. They take it more seriously. Money they take it very seriously. Then you have also people, unfortunately, with Medicaid fraud. Medicaid fraud are people that go and uh, they'll, they'll own, let's say, a nursing home or they'll own any medical facility and they'll bill Medicaid and Medicare, which is the government-funded uh, um, uh, health insurance, things that people don't need to do. And it's 100% Geneva, 100% stealing. And then at the end of the day, they caught somebody recently for over a, the biggest Medicaid or Medicare fraud in the history, over a billion dollars in fraud. And this guy is going away for a few life terms. So, 
you're looking at the world, the world is a very, very crazy world when it comes to money. Everybody is, first of all, just, I, I just have to point out, when you hear this in the news, right, unfortunately you should never hear of any Jewish person, I'm talking about all non-Jews right now, but if you ever hear, God forbid, a non-Jew, a Jewish person that, that was convicted of any of these things, you're not allowed to believe that. How, when they put it on the news, it doesn't mean that it's proven. It doesn't mean anything but yet that he was, you know, handcuffed and brought in. Who says that he's guilty? People cannot, people, it's very possible that people go get, uh, they get, they get uh, the FBI comes into their home, into their synagogue, and they, and they, but who said that it happened, right? If you have to be very careful in believing these things, it's a, it's a Lashon Ara, or a possible Rechilut. So, the, the, the idea is, is that people are crazy for money. So much so, is that they will do everything that it takes for them to make money. Now this is also, this is very unfortunate and I have a hard time believing it until I actually asked it. I asked a group of people, if you would be going, and I'll ask you, I really don't want to ask you, but I'll ask you. If somebody's offering you a plan, I'll give you one million dollars if you sit five years in jail. Would anybody take it? I asked people and they said yes, they would. 250, uh, let's make it simple, four years. Four years for one million dollars. You make 250 grand a year after taxes. <laughs> so some people say it's a good deal. Most people say no. I'm with the people that say no. Who wants to waste, who wants to waste uh, four you years of your life? No? What? You know who's going to say no? Who's going to make more in that four years? No. no. Somebody who is not worth it for him to sit in the prison for four years is the one who's going to say no. Somebody who, has, who, who, who uh, appreciates life more than money. Yeah. If you're going into prison, you are going to soon see that you're not going to be able to do some, many mitzvot. And said, we're going to soon see, are you allowed to, how much do you have to actually give up or pay to do mitzvot? And we're soon going to see uh, uh, something on that. But the, the crazy world is, is that people would willing to sit in prison. Somebody told me this a few weeks ago. I don't know if it's true or not. There's some sort of rapper that he paid somebody else to sit with, to, sit, to, to basically uh, take the hit for something that he did. And he sat 10 years in prison for him. At the end of the 10 years, he gave him a $10 million uh, uh, deal for some rap or whatever it was. He was a very wealthy, you know, he had a studio. I don't know. If this is true or not, I don't know if it's, uh, you know, but, but this is what I heard. And people, and, and I wouldn't be surprised because when I asked people, people said that they would sit, you know, for a million dollars, I'll sit for a few years in prison. They would sit for a few years in complete solitary just at the end of the day to get a, to get a paycheck, right? which is a shame because that means they're living the life the wrong way. What's your focus on life? Your focus on life is only money. If it's only money, then you're in a very, very serious play, problem. The, the life is not about money. Life is, is very driven by money, unfortunately, but life is not about money. Money is life, not, not life is money. That's true. <laughs> There's a lot of people that really would be better for them to be in prison because they do many sins. And if they're in prison, they don't do so many sins. So yeah, so you're right. But I'm saying that a general person that hopefully is doing, is listening to God, is doing Torah, doing is listening to mitzvot, is getting endless rewards, sitting for prison for, for a million dollars. Money, you know why, why uh, um, there, there, was, there was shows, I don't know if they're still on it, but oh, back in the day there, was, there were shows that they would pay people thousands of dollars if they do crazy stuff. Like go sit down in a tub full of spiders and snakes and scorpions. And you have people that they were scared from anything, from spiders, snakes and scorpions, but they'll sit in the tub for the money. For not even for getting the money, for just a possibility of probably maybe having a chance of winning 50 grand, 100 grand, or whatever they give. Not only that, then they say, okay, now eat the snakes. Now eat the scorpion. Eat the spider alive. And they would do it. They would do everything that they can to maybe win the money. It's, it's crazy. What type of world that we're living in? We're living in a world that people risk their lives for money. People uh, will, will disgust themselves, scare themselves, do everything just for a few dollars. Money, unfortunately, represents, the reason for this is, is money represents survival. Right? People think that the more they have money, the longer they can survive. It also represents power. And this is unfortunately very true. If you have money, you have power. And if you have power, then you have everything. And that's, that's the mentality of the American way of life. And to be honest, it's all the Western way of life. If somebody goes and he has a lot of money, he can manipulate anything that he wants to his favor as long as he does it the smart way. Then you also have things that money represents self-worth. right? If somebody is wealthy, he already thinks that he's, a, he's an amazing guy. You ever see how somebody walks in out of their Bentley? They don't walk humble, They're like, excuse me, you know, can I bother you something? They walk out of the Bentley, you know, their chest is like blown up with the air. Like, you know, they're over here, they'll be like, excuse me, I don't know, eh? Please, you ever see people drive Bentleys? The road is just like Kriyat uh, Yamsuf. Here's them, the Melech walking and driving through. And people think that they have money, that they're worth everything now. They're the most biggest, that they're more important. What happens when people have money? All of a sudden, people have money, they become smarter. Uh, you know, everyone comes to them to advice. When people have money, all of a sudden, they become better looking. Ask all the women that marry all the people just for money. People... <laughs> people have money, it, it changes the mentality, it changes your eyes. There's a saying, there's something called beer goggles. 
You know, beer goggles? Beer goggles means that if it's a non-Jewish term, that if you're sitting in a bar and you're going and you're chugging down beers, if there's a woman there, she becomes prettier after every beer. There's something called also money goggles. Is that if you, if the more you realize how much that person has money, the more he's a tzaddik. The more he's a big talmid chacham. The more he is an amazing person. Money changes people. So, speaking against money, at the end of the day, you know, may we all be blessed with money. Everybody wants money. And not, not that anybody said we all want money and we should all, but the, but the thing is, is where, what are we going to do with the money, right? Because not the Shem Hashem should give everybody here and everybody listening, everybody watching, we should give them uh, um, money ad die, right? But the purpose is to do the right thing with the money. There's a Gemara Be'a, 16a. It says, Kol mizonosav shel adam ktuvim lo merosh shana ve'ad yom ha-kippurim chutz me'otzat shabbatot ve'atzat yom tov ve'atzat benav le'talmud Torah. Translation. That if that the entire, your, your entire salary that you're going to make the entire year, not only the salary, everything that you will make, all income that you will make is already designated you from Rosh Hashanah until the next Yom Kippurim, until the following one, the, the year afterwards. Except for a few things, except for what you spend on Shabbos, on Sh- on if you have a Shabbat, a Shabbat meal, anything that you spend on that doesn't, it, doesn't come cal- it doesn't come calculated to your total expense. So if you spend more, you'll get more. Yom Tov also, and then also when you pay for your children to learn Torah and bring it, send them to Yeshivot, and people always complain, you know, I, I, I'm sending my son to public school. Why? It's very expensive. It's a uh, rabbi. Whew, you kidding me, you know? If this guy would just stop leasing one car that he has in his driveway <laughs> for the entire year, he would be able to pay for two people going to Yeshivot, right? People go and they spend $1,500 on a car. And they have the audacity to say that you can't pay for Yeshivot for, for tuition. Besides the fact that any Yeshivot that you go to, they'll give you a break. Even if you can't do it, they'll, they'll work something out with you. Excuses. That... Any of those, three, all those things says the Gemara that if you go and you spend money on it, your money will be increased. Right? You'll spend money. People wonder, well, people don't keep Shabbat. People don't understand what Shabbat is. People don't understand the amount of blessing that you have in Shabbat. You realize that Shabbat, you have an unlimited credit card. You have unlimited credit card. When you go to, when you imagine you're going to shop for Shabbat, your credit card doesn't belong to you. You just swipe, 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 swipe. Doesn't matter. As long as you're obviously you're keeping Shabbat, you're doing the right thing. Is it right? If you're making a Shabbat party for all boys and girls to hang out and you have all alcohol, I don't think that's uh, counted as uh, spending uh, money for Shabbat. Spending money for the Satan, maybe. So there's also the the, the Chazal tell us that a, a person can, if somebody was designated, somebody comes in Oshana and God says you're going to make 250 grand this year. Nobody, nobody can take that away from you. Your friend can try to steal from today until tomorrow. Nothing's going to work. People take very uh, uh, offense when somebody goes and, and, uh, and, you know, sketches them, steals from them, does something against them. You can't, if, if it wasn't decreed from Rosh Hashanah, nobody can touch you. Somebody stole your deal, nobody stole your deal. It was already decreed in Rosh Hashanah, you're not going to make that deal. Yeah, this guy was, you know, was a little shady guy, fine. That's, that's his problem. But he didn't do anything against you, that was already decreed from Rosh Hashanah. The, the, the Peleyot says something uh, very amazing, and I want to read a few things that the Peleyot says. And the Peleyot is not talking about something recently. Peleyot is something talking about a few years ago. I'm actually, not a few years ago, hundreds of years ago. I'm sorry. He said that the sin uh, that results from pursuing money, the sins that come out of it, is the majority of sins. And he goes and he says there's robbery. You have people that commit robbery just for, for money. Then you have fraud. Then you have people that swear in vain. They swear, oh, I swear I didn't do this. And meanwhile, they did do uh, something or they, what, they did uh, steal or whatever they did. Or you have people that do false oaths. They swear falsely just to maybe get more money from somebody else. Then you have lies and corruptions and prohibited food and desecrating of Shabbat and Yom Tov, right? The people go and they work on Shabbat because they think that's where their money is coming from. That it's very unfortunate because any money that you make on Shabbat is, is not blessed. Think you're going to see blessing with the money? It's like taking money and saying, oh, this is cursed money. Imagine someone walks over to you, gives you $100, and says, here, why don't you take this, you know, I just did a very, you know, imagine there's like a gypsy woman, right, walking with like rags, you know, smells from like B.O. that she hasn't showered in a few years, so you know she's serious in her magic, right, and then she goes over to her, and she, she kisses a dollar, and she sniffs it, and she says, here, take this $100 bill, um, it's cursed. Whoever touches it, then big crazy eyes is going to do something. Anybody's going to take that money? Most people are going to be like, you know what, no thank you. It's 100 bucks. Make it $1,000. People still, most people would still not touch it. Some people will be, uh, whatever, I don't care. Right? But most people won't touch it. For just a possibility of maybe a crazy woman, maybe curse the money. But then you go and you work on Shabbat, and you get the, the you think you're going to get blessing from money that you spit in God's face that you worked on Shabbat? That, that's real curses against the money. That's money that's not going to give you any blessing. People don't have a problem with that. No problem. Yeah, work on Shabbat, whatever. It doesn't matter. The next thing says the Peleyot, that out of the worst sins that people commit, for making money is Chilul Hashem, desecrating God's name. Amen. Amen. Desecrating God's name. Desecrating God's name is one of the worst sins that a person can do. 
says the Rambam in Holochot Shuvah. It's a very, very severe sid. If somebody goes and does, uh, uh, you know, a Chilul Hashem, it's very hard to, to, to make a, a Kapara on it. There is ways. You have to do a Kiddush Hashem, but it's, it's a lot of suffering and it's a lot of things that a person has to go to. Somebody goes and he, and now like I said before, anybody that gets arrested, you can't say automatically that they're guilty of whatever they did and you can't believe it. But let's say somebody really did something and he gets arrested. You know how big a Chilul Hashem is if somebody gets arrested with a Kippah? And again, you cannot believe it. You cannot believe it as a Jew. But there's so many non-Jews that are looking and they're saying, oh, look, of course, of course, yeah, Jews. Yeah, that's what they do. Right? Somebody actually has sent me an email and asked me a question. And he says, what does it matter? Most non-Jews don't care if it's a Jew, it's a non-Jew. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it's not a Chilul Hashem. Right? It's not a Chilul Hashem. What is the big deal of a Chilul Hashem? And the answer is, is it's, they, they care. What do you mean they don't care? So you know one person that doesn't care. You know how people read the news? You have somebody in the news, you have 10, 20 million people read the news. It's enough that one person says, oh, look at the Jews. Uh, of course, of course they're the ones. That's it. Chilul Hashem. It's, it's ridiculous that people, Chilul Hashem is desecrating God's name. For example, if somebody's a Jew, and a Jew is supposed to act a certain way, whether he has this on his head or whether he does not, it doesn't matter. He's a Jew, he has to act a certain way. And if he doesn't act a certain way, and another, other people will say, oh, yeah, of course, look at the Jewish, look at the nation, look at this people. Always oh, all they care about, they smell money, Everything, everything's money, right? That's a very big Chilul Hashem. Not only that, he goes, says the Peleo, it says that people, that their money is so valuable to them, that it will come at the expense of mitzvot. How many times there are people that don't go and pray with a minyan because of work? Because they don't pray, they don't pray, they don't learn. Why? Ah, I got to make a deal. I'm closing this deal. I'm going meeting with this client. I'm traveling for this thing. They sacrifice God for money, right? Which obviously they're not thinking. What are they thinking? They're thinking that they're making the money, not God. Says the Peleot, oh, oh let's, uh, let me read you a, a, actually a Gemara. First of all, the Peleot says, says these types of people, they inherit hell from this chasing of the money. Right? They, you know, let me quote it. It says he inherits, I'm going to quote, quote the Peleot. He inherits hell because of it and he descends into the grave. Who wants that? For what? For, for a few dollars that you're going to make anyways? If God give you the money anyways, you're going to make it. You think you're going to be able to trick God and making extra money on the side? So, uh, you know, there are people that come over to me and they want to do chuvah. Why do they want to do chuvah? Money related. To, you know, he made some money in a certain way. But he told me, I'm not ready yet. Give me a month. I got to close some little things. And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know, hey, you're trying to make chuvah, but in a month. I know, I have to, I have to do a few more things. And, and the chuvah is contingent. He said, listen, I'll do chuvah if, if I'll give it like God four months. If I see I don't make any money, then I'm going to go back to doing it. Right? Very tough thing. What are you going to do something like that? You know, how do you, somebody comes to you and says, I'll do chuvah temporarily. So what I told him, I pray to God that this is right. I said, do chuba that way. At least for four months, you're not going to steal. You're not going to do whatever you're doing. You're not going to sell drugs to kids. You're not going to do these things. Regardless of if that chuba is going to help, at least you're going to have less, uh, less to deal with over here. Right? Obviously, you should stop it completely. And Bezal Hashem, hopefully, if he stops it, you, people get into, sen- into their sense. When, when somebody's in a sin, they don't think the right way. Once they're out of the sin, they're okay. I, I asked also, I asked the person, I said, you're not afraid of getting arrested? And he says, to be honest, no. He says, I don't mind getting arrested. The only reason I don't want to get arrested is because I'm going to embarrass my family. He doesn't mind getting arrested. He doesn't mind sitting in prison as long as the money is good. But what's holding him back? Baruch Hashem, something kibu davayim. Unless he has something over there. Says the Gemara in Eruvun, Eruvin, page 65b. It says, Bishlosha dvarim adam nika. A person, a man, is recognized by three things. Bikiso, bikiso, bikaso. It sounds very familiar. I'll translate. Bikiso is his cup. How is he when he drinks? He drinks a little bit of this. How does he start getting, right? You could tell how a person is when he's drunk. What does he start talking about? What does he start looking into? How is his thought process? The next thing is Bikiso, in his pocket. How is he, you could tell a person by how he deals with money. Does he, the Rashi says on the Gemara, he says that he, that he does business honestly. He goes and he, you know, you could tell a lot about a person the way that he conducts business. Somebody goes and collects money from him. You could tell also a lot about a person by, by certain things. And then Bikiso, when a person gets angry. When a person gets angry, everything's off the table. People are not themselves. They're, there's like a spirit that goes over them. They're, they get like all angry and all, you know, fired up and everything gets, and they turn into a different person. They, they turn into the Hulk. Right? They're completely different. That's how you can tell who a real person is. If you ever realize what's going on over here, when a person's drunk, he's not him. When a person's angry, he's not him. When money is involved, he's not him. You want to know how to tell a person? You tell who the person is when he's not himself. Which means is, is that when he's not being able to put the facade, to put that fake cover up, be like, oh, I'm a big tzaddik. Yeah, of course, a big tzaddik. But then suddenly when his wife upsets him, whoo, everyone clear out of the way, right? Somebody does a business deal with him, you see how much curses on he gets on the phone? That's how you tell a real person. This is also very important when people go on dates. When people are in a dating and they want to see a girl, or the girl wants to see a guy, they, they date. But they don't realize is that it's all fake. Everybody's putting on, you know, 
of course, the guy puts on his one single shirt that he owns, right? And you know, there was a joke that there was once a, the, um, a, a, a girl went on a date with a man. And she sees him, he picks her up, and she's like, wow, this guy has a really nice shirt. This guy has good taste. And the date goes well, they go on a second date. They go on the second date, and she says, wow, this guy has, he has good taste in shirts. This is a really nice shirt. They go on the third date, and she says, oh, wow, this guy has only two shirts. Because he kept on putting back the other shirt. The people, when they go on a date, they, put on a, they, they pretend to be what they think the other person wants them to be. You want to know how the person really wants really is, you have to catch him off guard. When he's off guard, that's how you tell what the person, how the person really is. So the Gemara, the Gemara tells us the secret already. The Gemara tells us, you want to see how a person is? See how he is with his money. See how he works with his money. There are some people that uh, when it comes to them, they'll live large. No problem. But if their wife takes a credit card, bill, credit card woo, stand, uh, you know, stand down. You got to be careful over there. He reviews the thing with a microscope. He says, what's this? You know, makes charts. This month you spend this much on tomatoes. Why so much? You know? And meanwhile, he's driving a Mercedes that's worth $1,500 a month that he pays on that. And he's, and he's complaining to his wife about buying the fresh tomatoes instead of the old tomatoes. So the, the Peleo, it's, can I trouble you for the, yeah, sorry. Thank you. So the Peleo then goes on and says that uh, a person has to believe, thank you very much, a person has to believe with complete faith that every money that he has comes from God. When a person realizes that the dealings that he has with money is, very, is much different than the dealings that he would have otherwise. It's also interesting when you have, uh, you know, there, there are certain people, and I, unfortunately I spoke to them, they'll drive Range Rovers. What do Range Rovers lease cost? Uh, $1,500? $1,200. When they come and say, hey, you want to buy a tzitzit? See what, twelve ninety nine for a tzitzit. Maybe there's something irregular or slightly irregular that you could get maybe a few dollars off. Mezuzot. Maybe you have something that's just, you know, the, just the beer minimum, Rabbi. The beer minimum. No, there's a kosher. I want a kosher, but the beer minimum, right? Meanwhile, he has the, all, the, all the possible additions that he has on his car. That he, that, uh, on that, you know, that he has the navigation, the Bluetooth, the backup camera, the leather, the heat, the cooling seats, the hearing, heating steering wheel, the lane recognition. Every possible addition he has on the car, he'll put $400 extra... Put it in, throw it in. When it comes to mezuzot, comes to tzitzit, comes to maybe uh, donating some money for, for a synagogue, I'll give you $50. Is that okay? Can we, you know, $50 is good? What are you talking? Where are you spending your money? What's going on over here? People spend very ridiculous things on money. I'm going to tell you a few things that I picked up of what people spend money. And I, I, to be honest, I don't believe it, but it's true. There's a certain people, I'm not going to tell you who they are, but I'm just going to tell you what they, what they, uh, what they do. They have, uh, there's a certain woman in Hollywood she, her iPhone cost $33,000. Why? Because it was coated in 24 karat gold. There was a certain actor who bought a Trinosaurus bitar skull, a skull of a dead animal from who knows how long ago. He paid $276,000 for a skull. So he could sit over there in the, in the in, I mean, the truth is this should not be any surprise because people pay millions, millions of dollars. I went with my wife to this uh, museum of art museum, and they showed me all these like uh, a fancy, expensive. I don't even know. I don't care so much about art, but what's the, what's the most expensive uh, Van Gogh or, or oh, Picasso? Mm -hmm. I yeah. So I saw the Mona Lisa, and when I saw the Mona Lisa, and I'm like, I don't know if that is Picasso, or whoever drew that, and I'm like, this is it. This is what people go. It's this. It's this big. It's this big. A little woman smiling. I. I what, what do people go crazy for? And then people showed me other things, and then they show, and they, we took a tour, and it was like, oh, this painting is like $1.4 million. I turned over to my wife, and I said, my daughter can paint better. Our, you know, our little daughter can paint better than this. It's little squiggles. It looks like finger paint. And people spend, why? Because of the name. Sure, come on, it's a Van Gogh, it's a Picasso. Are you kidding me over here? They'll post it on the right, you know? They'll move the, the, the oldest Farim, put the Picasso over there. Come on, look at this. And it, looks, it doesn't look good. It doesn't look nice to me at all. But... Whatever, people spend it on, on ridiculous things. There's a certain woman in Hollywood also, a singer. She spent $50,000 on a ghost machine. It's to detect ghosts. She's very into the paranormal. So she goes and she spends $50,000 to detect ghosts. She would have been smart. She would have put a mezuzah. A lot cheaper. No, no, none, none of them are Jewish, as far as I know. <laughs> there's, another, there's another person in Hollywood who spent $325,000 for a doghouse. There are people that, not in a, you can't find that house in, in uh, Brooklyn, but if you go out to, to Texas or whatever, out in the Midwest or anywhere actually outside of New York, you could buy a mansion for $325,000. She just, just for the dog. 
the little pooch gets more, more luxury than people who are striving to feed. There are people that can't feed, put bread on the table. Well, and what about the dogs get inherited? Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's right. <laughs> yeah. I tell you, we live in a we live in a crazy world. We live in a crazy world. This is Rabbi Elon Ruben who was here who was here recently. He was here a few days, uh, you know, Sunday. He said, on the dollar, he says, what? In God we trust. It says, in God we trust. He says, you know what that means? Not that in God we trust. It means that the dollar is God. The do- you know, yeah, of course we trust. It. The God is the dollar right here. This is, the, this is God. People will pray and do anything for, their, for money. If you pay somebody enough, they'll do anything. At least certain people. There was once, uh, uh, there was also that, you know, money unfortunately changes people. There are people that, let's say, didn't have money, and when they have money, and suddenly, they, let's say, they make it well. Baruch Hashem, God blessed them, and they, they, they were successful in money, and in business, and they made a lot of money. It changes them. It, it, that money changes people. It, there, was a, there was a story that once there was a poor man, and despite his poverty, his house was always open to guests. People would come in, and they would, you know, uh, um, you know, he would feed them out of his own pocket, whatever money that he had, no problem, he would give it to them. And they would always, always come to his, uh, to his house. Eventually, because of all this chesed that he did, God said, listen, this guy really knows how to use his money. Let's give him some more money. He gave him some more money, and this guy, a little uh, switch flicked on in his brain and everything. He bought a big mansion, and he bought expensive furniture, rugs, and all these expensive uh, y- y- couches and chandeliers. When the poor people started coming into his house, he was like, listen, you know, you're dirtying my rug, you're doing this, take off your shoes, don't do it. What's that? Is that dirt? Is that dust? Please wait outside, I'll bring the food to you. And slowly, slowly, he kept on pushing people away until people were not invited anymore into his house. And people started complaining, what happened to this guy? He used to be so, so, so they sent a rabbi to him. And the rabbi comes into his home, and he's like, he opens up the door, he's like, oh, my dear rabbi, well, of course, the chavod, he opens the door wide, please come in, can I give you, you know, can I offer you anything? Give him to drink, give him a little chai, gives a little food to eat. Then the, then the rabbi starts walking, takes a self-tour around the house. <laughs> he starts walking into the living room, and he sees over there, there's a window, next to the window, there is a huge, beautiful mirror. And he goes over to this, per, uh, to this person, and he's like pretending to be like ignorant, the rabbi. And he looks in the window, and then he looks in the mirror, and he says, something's wrong with this window. I can't see outside. All I can see is myself. And the guy says, uh, rabbi, uh, this, is, this is not a window. This is a mirror. He's like, no, no, no. It's like, this is glass, and this is glass. What's the difference? And he's like, oh, this is a very big difference. This is plain glass. This has, when you, this has glass, but it has silver in the back of it. So the rabbi says, what's the big difference? What's the difference? He says, so the, so the rich man says, says, when you put silver in behind of it, you see yourself. So the rabbi says, that's right. He says, when you put silver, all you see is yourself. When you put money in front of you, you put money in your pocket, all that you see is yourself. When you become wealthy and you become, uh, you know, you have a Baruch Hashem Bracha and Atzlacha and all this, and everything that you do, suddenly all you start thinking about is yourself. Forget about the poor people, forget about, that, forget about everything else. You're making my carpet dirty, you're making this dirty, you're making everything else dirty. This, unfortunately, is not a new problem that the Jews had. The Jews, when they, when they went out of Egypt, when they went out of Egypt, everybody was a multimillionaire. The, the, the Egyptians, we, took, we had money from the Egyptians that they gave us, that from the sea, they took, we, we had so much money that we didn't know what to do with it. So much also, what did we do with all that money? We made a golden calf. A golden calf and prayed to a calf. Now you think, God, would, would, well, how would you punish? Take away all their gold. They're obviously not using it right. God said, no, no, no. Not going to take away the, their gold. Rather, what they're going to do, Instead of abolishing gold and taking it away from them, he says, no, let them use it for, for making a Bet Migdash. Let them go and now donate to, to, a, a, to a Bet Migdash. And everybody went and donated money for the, for the Bet Migdash. Money can be used for two things. It can be used for bad and it can be used for very good. The big problem is that people that have money, not always do they understand how much the good that they could actually uh, uh, you know, do with it. Now, how much money, if let's say a mitzvah comes your way, how much money do you need to spend for a mitzvah? For example, let's say there is, you're in a place that there's no tefillin. One person has tefillin and he's selling it for exorbitant amount of money. Selling it for 20 grand. What, do you, do you have to go and spend 20 grand for a tefillin? So the answer is it depends how much you're worth. If let's say you're, you're, you have 100 grand and 20 grand is 20% of your, of your value of how much money you have, you are required to go and, and, sp- and spend the 20 grand for a mitzvah. If let's say you're worth 50, the all you have is 50 grand. You are now required to spend almost half your money for a mitzvah. That's a for mitzvah, a positive commandment. Talit, a tog, a, uh, a tefillin, all those things. If you, you have to spend up to 20% of your money in order to do, make, to do a mitzvah. More than that, you don't have to. What about a negative commandment? What about a negative commandment where you would have to, if you don't spend a certain amount of money, you're violating a certain commandment, which means there's a difference between positive commandments and negative commandments. Positive commandments is you're required to do this, Tefillin, you have to put on tefillin. A negative commandment is, don't do this, don't steal. Don't do, whatever, don't do whatever it is that you have to do. 
So don't eat non-kosher food. What is, how much you have to spend to not violate a negative commandment? The answer is all your money. Up to all your money you have to give up so you don't violate a negative commandment. That's why if somebody lives in a place that's not Jewish and he can't practice religion, he's not allowed to live there. Doesn't matter if he's going to incur financial loss. Doesn't matter if he's going to incur an expensive. Nothing matters because he's not allowed to live there. And that's why also you have certain converts. There are many people that I, I know, I know people that they're trying to convert, but they're not, they don't live over here. They live in a faraway place. Nobody, nobody's going to convert them because if, how are you going to be Jewish if you're, if you're living somewhere that there's nothing to do with Judaism? You're gonna, you don't have a synagogue. You don't have kosher food. You don't have anything. What, we're going to convert you to do more sins? They're not going to convert you. So, the, now, what about enhancing a mitzvah? Enhancing mitzvah, so there's a pasuk in uh, Shemot, in Exodus chapter 15, verse 2. Where it says, Zekeli va'anveu. This is God and I will glorify him. How much money do you have to spend to enhance a mitzvah? For example, you could buy something basic, and then you could buy the supermodel, right? You could buy the, the, the more advanced version of whatever it is. You could buy regular talit or you could buy extra. And the answer is you, have, you should spend up to a third more. So if something is worth $100, you take a third of that and you can add that more, and that's considered something that you do mihuda. And this, uh, um, you know, I had once a friend of mine that he used to, you know, he, pe some people, uh, it's very odd, but what do Jews brag about? Jews brag about, about how much of a good deal they got. N if you go to non-Jews, right, how much are you paying for this car? $1,500. They'll give you the maximum as possible. A Jew is just the opposite. Nah, I got six fifty for this thing right here, right? Because it's so, oh, look at the deal that I got. The non-Jew wants to show how much money he spent. The Jew wants to show how much money he saved. And uh, so there was once somebody that, that came over to me, a close friend of mine, and he said uh, he bought a lulav and a tog. When did he buy the Lulav Etog? Like two hours, three hours before Sukkot. So what happened? All the people that are closing up their shop, they just need to get rid of their things. So you could get the cheapest deal on all of them. He's like, $18. Look how beautiful it is. $18. So I go over to him and I said, two weeks ago you told me you spent $150 on a pair of shoes. And you all, so you spent $150 for your feet. But for God, you're going to wait last minute to possibly get a good deal and then brag about it that's only $18? And he says, you're right. Didn't say anything to me else after that. The next year, a whole year passed, and he, he calls me up, and he says, by the way, I want you to know, I bought a lavender talk, $120, from what you told me last year. Not everybody's like that. I've met very few people where I would actually tell them things, and they would actually say, you know what, you're right. And they work on it, and they do it. This guy was the type of guy that did it. I told him, a year later, a year, a year later, he still remembered that, and he said, he bought it two weeks earlier, paid top dollar for something, possibly you could have got the same way. Why? To show God, look how, look how much I love your mitzvot. I'm going to run and I'm going to get the best deal. Forget about the price. I know you give me the money. So you're saying you can't bargain on stuff like that, right? You could. You could bargain. Um, but what do you show God when you go last minute? You know, you could. Let's say you go to a certain place and you go, 20, uh, you know, you go two weeks in advance. You find something really nice. You, you know, negotiate. There's nothing wrong with negotiating. But once you start, you know, $100, too much for me. Meanwhile, you know, you bought a shirt for $100 three hours ago. But for a talk, not worth it. So then it shows something. It shows something, to, you know, so, so God says, I give you the money, and this is what you're using the money for, basically. The Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, Rabbi Yehuda Anasi, he, uh, it was uh, something very interesting that uh, it says that he used to honor the, the, the rich. And it was, very, it was very odd. Rabbi Yehuda Anasi was the one who compiled all the Mishnayot. He, he basically put the, to the oral law, well, how we know it today, in effect. And he was, not only was he extremely, extremely righteous rabbi of the entire generation, he was also extremely, extremely wealthy. So you think, why would he honor the wealth, the, the, the people that have money? So you think, okay, maybe it's because uh, he knows what money can buy. Money can buy a lot of things. But that, that, that cannot be. Why? Because before he died, he pointed up his ten fingers to heaven. And he says with all the money that he had, he never derived even a little bit of pleasure from the money that he has in this world. He didn't use it for his pleasure. All the money that God gave him, he used for the right, for the right things. So obviously he wasn't praising the, poor, the rich people for, for money. So why was he praising the, the rich people? The Lubavitch Tereba answers and he says that everybody comes into this world with a certain task. Each and every person one over here in the room has a different mission in life. You have a mission and you have to complete that mission, right? Whoever's watching, you each have a mission. And you have, your objective in your lifetime is to complete the mission. Some people don't need money for the mission. Some people need a lot of money for the mission. Hence, you have poor people. Hence, you have rich people. But everybody has free will. And if everybody has free will, that means that if God gives somebody a lot of money, then he's, there's a lot of risk involved in that. There's a lot of risk because that guy could decide whatever he wants to do with the money. 
Says, says the Lubavitch Rebbe, says, you know why Rebbe, the, you know, Rebbe Huda Nasi honored the rich people? He says, because God trusted you with so much money. He says, that means that you could do something with it. That means you could do something with it. You could go and donate it. Instead of redoing your kitchen every six years, six, that's between years and, and weeks, every six years, right? Maybe donate some money to the synagogue. Maybe donate some money to help save Jewish people for that, are, that are, don't know anything about Judaism. Maybe go and help some poor people that don't have any bread on their table. So, the, there is, a, there is a, a certain law that people don't really understand fully. They'll go and they'll steal, but as a joke. I don't know, it's a joke. You know, and, uh, to, you know, people, what they do is that they'll go, they'll go into somebody, especially some more with the, younger, with the younger crowd. They'll go and they'll grab something, they'll steal it. And the guy will go crazy, oh my God, where's my, where's, you know, this is all my money. And they'll be like, ah, I got it, all that, I got you, prank. Yeah. And he goes and returns it. That's not a lot from the Torah. That, uh, the, the Pasuk says, in Ezekiel, chapter 33, verse 15, you consider a rasha, you consider it a wicked person. All these pranks that people pull, if you pull a prank by stealing something from somebody, even though you're going to return it, you're still considered a wicked person. You're not allowed to, you're not allowed to do that. There, there are, uh, not only that, is also, this is very important, you're not allowed to buy stolen goods. I, I remember there was one time I was walking, uh, you know, you, let's say you, somebody's walking down 47th Street, right? And you get some guy over there, you know, like a real brother, you know, sitting over there in the corner. And he goes over to you, his pants by his ankles, you know, he's got the full, uh, the full setup. And he's like, he's like, yo, brother, he's like, uh, you, want, you want a Rolex? And he takes out this, like, suitcase and he opens it up and you see a bunch of Rolex there. And be like, uh, where, where'd you get this from? Don't worry about it, I got you. Well, whatever you want. I'll give you a good price. You know, if you think that's possibly that those items are stolen, you're not allowed to buy it. Why are you not allowed to buy from a, from a, a stolen item? Because you are helping the person steal. If he has customers, then he's going to go and he's going to start... Uh, you know, stealing more because he has customers. But if nobody buys from him, he says, what's the point? It's not worth it. There was one time I was, I was driving and somebody, and then I pulled over. Somebody pulled up right next to me in a van. This is years ago. And he goes, he, he rolls down the window and he looks at me. Right? This is the second, the second that you know that something's fishy is when he looks at me and then he does a scan, you know, of all the, of all the area. All right, his radar is working. And uh, he's like, yo, he's like, uh, you want to you wanna buy a boombox? This is back when boomboxes still existed. So back then I was very different. I was like, maybe, what you got? So he's like, why don't you come out? I'll show you. And he goes and he opens up his truck and he points me a bunch of boombox. So I tell him, I'm like, where did you get these? So he's like, oh, let's just say they fell off the truck. So I said, thank you, I know, thank you. Baruch Hashem, I had the sense. I said, thank you, I know, thank you. And, and he drove away. You're not allowed to buy. Halacha, halacha, from the halacha, you're not allowed to buy from people like that. It's stolen goods, and you're not allowed to buy from it. Now, I remember there was one time I had a friend of mine. It didn't happen to me, but a friend of mine, he went and he bought a, a laptop off somebody. And he, he, he opened up the box, and it says, here, you want to check it out? Check out this laptop. He gave him a crazy deal. You're talking about like 10 years ago where, you know, where, and, and he, where laptops were going for $1,000, $1,200, you know, the, the, the cheapest laptops. And he offered him a very good laptop for $500. So very tempting. And he says, all right, let me see what you got. And he opens it up and he says, here, why don't you play around with it? Go. And he opens it up. He sees everything is legit. And he says, you know what? Fine. He happened to have a few hundred dollars on him. And the guy says, you got a deal. He says, my friend says to this guy, you have a deal. He closed the laptop, put it in the box. They exchange the money and they leave. When my friend gets home, he opens up the box two two-liter bottles of soda over there. The guy somehow last minute switched him, and it was a real laptop, but he switched it, and he ended up, he says it was the most expensive soda bottles I ever bought. $500 for two liters, for two two-liters. So there are people, you know, you think you're getting a good deal. At the end of the day, you're not, you're not getting anything. But you're not allowed to, you're not allowed to uh, uh, go and, and uh, deal with these people. You're not allowed to buy from these people. And there's also, it goes into a wide variety of things. Somebody gives you a deal in real estate. And, and, he had, and you know that he, how did he get the, the deal? He stole it, whatever. He went around some shady people you should not deal with. Unless, but that is again that you know that they're shady, not that you assume and it's possible because there's a lot of the Shonaha, a lot of the Chilut that goes out over there. Question? It says in the, I'll give you a Pasuk, it says in Proverbs, chapter 29, verse 24. He who shears with a thief hates his soul. He's talking about his own soul. So not good things, basically. I'll let you use your imagination to what you think this pasuk means. And you could also look it up. You're, you're, you're one who deals with stolen goods is as if he robs the public. It's as if he robs the public because he's assisting, he's helping this guy uh, steal money. So the, uh, there was once, uh, um, you know, I'll tell you a, a crazy story. This is from the Apta Rebbe, who was a Rami Shua Heshel Avath. He said once a story. He said one time there was a simple Jew. And this simple Jew, 
it was told about him that any blessing that he gives becomes, becomes a, it comes true instantly. And the rabbi kept on hearing it. Oh, yeah, don't worry about it, rabbi. I went to this, uh, went to this, pers- this person. He said a blessing, and we're good. And everything that happened, instantly. So the rabbi said, how is it possible? He says, I've never seen, you know, I've never seen that before. So he says, let me go check it out. So he found out where he is. It turns out that this guy owns a little inn, and he's like the bartender of this, uh, of this inn as well. So he says, you know what? Let me go and check him out. Let me see what's his source, what's his secret. So he goes over there, inconspicuously, he sits down in the, in the bar, and he watches, you know, this person and, and what he does. And he sees that this, you know, the owner is going and he's pouring people drinks and with all the Gentiles, or anybody, you know, drinking, to, you know, singing together with them, basically, you know, making business. And he's thinking, he's like, what's so special about this guy? He says, so much so that he wasn't even, he didn't even see anything special, is that, you know, maybe he took a lot of breaks to pray and to meditate on God. He took a short break to quickly pray Mincha and then went back to working. But then he saw things that he completely could, he could not understand. There was somebody that came in, a woman came frantic, frantically and crying. And he says, Rabbi, he says, she goes over to this bartender and says, please, I beg of you, please help me. I have a child that's very deathly ill. Please, please help me. So he goes over to her and he says, your child should be healthy and he should be blessed and everything should be okay. One hour goes by, she comes in with a big basket of fruit. And she says, my dear friend, thank you so much. This is for you. He's completely healthy. The rabbi is sitting there with his mouth wide open and says, how is this possible? And then he sees, now a short while later, another person comes in, whispers him something in his ear. He whispers him something back, and they leave. A few hours later, the guy comes back, and he sees that this guy is, uh, you know, he's thanking him. He's like profusely. The rabbi said, I've never seen this thing in my life. How is this possible? This person, what is his secret? So he says, you know, I can't say anything over there. Maybe he stays up all night learning to walk. He does Kabbalistic things at night. Maybe that's where it works. So he says, let me see. Let me wait till at night. He waits till at night, and all he hears is this guy snoring. He says, where, where's this guy? He says, you know what? Maybe it's Shabbat. Maybe he does Shabbat such, with such a level. That's where he gets his power of blessing. He goes to Shabbat, nothing, everything's regular, everything, you know, it's a simple, good Jew. He says, what? So he goes over to him and he says, I beg of you, he's like, he's like, tell me, tell me what is it that you do that makes you have this power of blessing? I've never seen this, not with the righteous people, not with the books, never seen something like this before in my life. So the, the Jew says, uh, you know, listen, uh, to be honest, it's, it's, I have good luck, you know, I, I, I don't know, I, I can't explain to you why I, you know, these things happen. So the rabbi says, he says, no, no, no. He says, you have to tell me. He says, I know you're hiding something. Tell me, exa- tell me what happens right now. And the Jew says, you know, really innocently, he says, Rabbi, I wish I could tell you, I really don't know. So the rabbi says, you know, starts making, twisting the, the knobs a little bit. He says, listen, if you don't tell me, then I must assume that it's coming from the impure forces, demons and magic and all those things, and I have to announce it to the whole congregation not to associate with you. So the guy gets very scared. He says, Rabbi, I, I'm telling you, I prob- you know, it's, I'm not doing anything. He says, I really don't know for the, for the life of me. The rabbi saw that he's really serious, so he says, all right, let me ask you some questions. Maybe you did some sort of mitzvah, you know, really out of the ordinary, and that's why you have this power? And the guy says, to be honest, nothing. Uh, you know, I didn't do anything. So he, the rabbi says, maybe you have some great, uh, you know, ancestors who are completely righteous people, and because of that, you're making so much, you, you know, your, your blessing works so well. And he says, listen, my parents were, and my grandparents were all very simple people. So the rabbi says, so I don't understand. And he, and he turns around and he starts praying to God. He prays to God and says, God, please open my eyes. Let me see where the source of this blessing is so I, can know your, so I can see your wonders and how you work. The second he finishes the prayer, he turns around and he sees two boxes on the counter. So he goes over to this, to this uh, barkeeper and he says, uh, this innkeeper, and he says, uh, what's those two boxes for? So the innkeeper says very, you know, very innocently, he says, oh, it's for me and my partner. And he says, he says, oh, so he's, he says, what do you mean for you and your partner? So he says, you know, every money that I make, 50% profits goes to me, 50% profit goes to my partner. So, the, you know, the rabbi says, and who's your partner? And this guy, completely innocent, without even thinking anything, he's like, oh, my partner is God. And the rabbi says, uh-huh, now I see. So he says, maybe you can explain to me how you got God to be your partner. So he said, he said, many years ago, he says the business was failing. And uh, things, the caravan, the, the inn needed a lot of upkeep and it needed a lot of renovations. And he didn't have the money to do it. So his wife kept on saying, listen, go to town, find the rich person, get an investor, become a partner in it so you, we could build the business back up again. So he kept on pushing it off. He said, who wants a business partner? If you have a business partner, then you have to just, you know, it's a headache and this and you have to, do, he says, I don't want any business partner. But eventually his wife kept on pushing him and he said, fine, you know what, fine. He goes and he starts making his way to town. As he's walking into town, he's thinking, he's like, listen, he, says, he goes to God, he says, why do I need to get a regular person business partner? I'll make you a deal, God. You give me the money, you become my partner. 50% to me, 50% for you. He walks a few hundred yards, he, found, he finds a, a bag, a, a, like a wallet full of money. He opens the wallet, he sees it's full enough money for renovation, he says, thank you, God, and he goes back. He says, ever since then, he has two boxes, one for him and one for his partner. He says, he takes the, half of his profits for himself, for his partner, he donates it for poor people, for yeshivot, for synagogues, for different things that, he, that, for, for, that are meant for spiritual usage. 
And uh, the rabbi says, he, he blessed this guy. He gave him a kiss. He says, you don't know how, how special you are. This guy, completely innocent. Didn't even he didn't tell the rabbi, well, God's my partner. Of course, I'm. he didn't even, wasn't anything. It was, it was normal. It was normal for God to be my partner. The rabbi says, says when you have a partner, he says, you, your partnership and everything. Your partnership and everything. You give 50% of profits to him. You, give, you got 50% of profits to you. Then whatever one partner says, the other part, partner has to do. You go and you bless somebody, the other partner, your God, has to listen to your blessing. Now, that's why your blessing comes true. Look at the power of money. Look at the power of the, of, of the blessing. I want to I say one more so, a short story about Rothschild, about how they made the money, and then I want to go to Skulot, if that's okay. Right? Skulot is uh, um, uh, how, do you, you know, how can you make more money, basically, if through the spiritual way. Also, we should really explain what Skulot actually means. So if, everybody here is familiar with Rothschild? The name, nobody's familiar. Rothschild is one of the most uh, probably richest families ever. Rothschild, um, I don't know if this is true, they say they have the combined worth of over $350 billion. And uh, uh, combined with all their, they also married into the family to keep the money into the family. Uh, uh, very interesting, the history of the Rothschilds. But, uh, um, and then you get people that start going a little bit, uh, you know, when, you know, oh, the Illuminati, and they run the, you know, yeah, can't relax your horses, right? Uh, they, you know, both of them, they were blessed with money, and they did a lot of good things with their money. So there was once, uh, I want to tell you a story about the first Rothschild. The first, first, first one, right, you're talking back in the 1700s. And where they, because they, they became wealthy for, for they, had, they had money for a few hundred years. So there was a town in Poland, Galicia. In Galicia, Poland, there lived a very, very righteous man. And it was Rabbi Herschel Chukatower. I'm for sure pronouncing it wrong, but from the city that he was in. This rabbi was an extremely devout person to the community. Besides being a, a, a righteous man, a Kabbalist, a big, a big uh, uh, tzaddik, he would always go and collect money and give it to poor people and arrange for them so that they have enough money, enough food, enough, uh, enough resources. So he goes and, uh, uh, you know, things were getting very busy. So he wanted to hire somebody as a, to help him, you know, with, with uh, sort of like an assistant. So he, he saw somebody over there by the name of Moses Rothschild. Moses Rothschild at that time had no money. Right? He had no money, he was a poor person, and he's, you know, he had a job opportunity, so he said, sure, why not? So the rabbi goes, and he trusts him, and they have a great, great uh, relationship. This, guy, this Moses Rothschild was a completely honest man, did everything the rabbi asked, was a completely amazing person. And the rabbi felt very confident very, you know, in his trustworthy servant. Years go by, and then this Rothschild, you know, he gets married, and he, and he says, you know, listen, rabbi, I have to move away, you know, away to, to where my wife is, and they bid the, their affairs. As they, they leave, they, they say their goodbyes. Shortly after they, this Moses Rothschild left, the rabbi looks, he had, a, he had a, a lot of money that collected for the upcoming holiday to give to all the poor people. A lot of money. And he opens up the drawer and it's gone. No money there. And he's like, he's like, only one person knows about it. Only one person knows about it. We'll be done in like five minutes. Um, is that good? Are we good with that? We have that? Okay. So he, he, he says, uh, um, only one person knew where this money was. And that person was this Moses, but how could he steal it? It doesn't make any sense to me. And he's going back and forth, this rabbi, and he says, it doesn't make any, he's the only person that knew about it. You know, he, so he's probably making excuses for him. You know what, this guy probably took it. Why? Because he needed some money. And he wanted to go and he wanted to, to uh, you know, borrow the money maybe for the wedding. And, you know, so let me go to him. Let me make the travel out. And I'm sure he'll pay back. After the holiday comes and goes, he goes and makes his trip out to this uh, Moses Rothschild. And the rabbi goes over to him and he says, you know, I'm really a little bit upset, but, you know, I found some money and it's lost and you're the only one who knows about it. And he says, the rabbi goes straight out, he says, I'm here to get the money back. And this, this Moses Rothschild gets completely white with tears in his eyes. And he doesn't say a word and he says, okay, hold on one second. He runs into the back room, he takes all the money that he has on, you know, that he, from the wedding, from everything that he had, and he collects it and he gives it to the rabbi. And he says, listen, rabbi, this is only half the sum, but give me some time, I'm going to work it, I'm going to pay you back everything. And the rabbi says, it's okay, take your time, pay it back. I'm just happy that you realized of what you did, and I'm happy that you're returning the money. And the rabbi goes back into his, uh, into his, into his home, and shortly over the next short period of time, this, this Moses Rothschild worked really hard over hours, extra thing, just to pay back, to get the full sum back to the rabbi. A few months go by, and there's a knock on the door of the rabbi, and the, 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 chi the chief of police is standing over there, and the guy's like, uh, you know, can I help you? And he says, are you this or this rabbi? And he says, yeah, please come with me. And meanwhile, this guy is from Israel, you know, he's trying to pray. He's like, who knows what happened to the Jewish people? Who knows what's going bad going to happen? And he gets into, he gets into the police station, and uh, they sit him down in the interrogation room, and he says, uh, um, he says he bring, they bring in a woman. He says, do you recognize this woman? And he says, nope. 
And he says, maybe you don't recognize it, but uh, did you uh, have a certain amount of money lost from you in the past uh, few months? And he's like, yeah. And, and then the rabbi goes on without even stopping. He says, but we found the person and he gave back the money. And this, this officer starts looking at him in disbelief and he's like, you know, you Jews, you're something special. So I don't know, I can't put my finger on you guys. And the rabbi is like looking at him confused now. And he says, what are you talking about? So he, go, he pulls over this, this, uh, woman, this woman and he takes out a, a, a wallet. He puts it on the, on the floor, on the, on, the, on the desk. And this time the rabbi is looking surprised. And the officer says, do you know who this uh, wallet belongs to? And he's like, yeah, that, that's my wallet. So he says, where did you get it from? And he says, this woman, many months ago, she used to work for you. She used to be your cleaning lady for a short period of time. You were so involved in your community affairs, you probably didn't even realize it. But she worked for you, but don't worry about it. She confessed to everything. He says, what happened was, a few, she worked for you for a short period of time. She found this money, and she dug it in her backyard, and she hid it there. After a short period of time, she goes and she says, uh, you know, I have some money. Why do I need to work? So she quit her job, and then she went, and she bought him a nice pair of shoes. And then she took another coin, and she bought another nice thing, another nice thing. And then people started looking at her and be like, wait a minute. How does this woman have money? So they started asking questions, and meanwhile, the police started getting involved, and they found the money, and she confessed to everything. He says, here's your money. So the rabbis completely shocked. He's like, he's like, but somebody else confessed. He's like, how is that even possible? You know, somebody else already gave me the money. He's not sure what to do. He leaves, takes the money, he leaves, and he runs back to, he goes straight over to this guy Moses Rothschild. And he goes over to this guy Moses Rothschild, and he says, he says, what, are you, what, what happened over here? This is my money. Did, did you take the money or not? So, the, so this trusty servant, he says, Moses Rothschild goes to him, and he says, to be honest, Rabbi, no, I didn't take your money. He says, but when I, you came here and you were so serious and you were so sincere and I saw that you needed this money and I knew that if, you would have, if I would have offered you to give you the money, you wouldn't have taken it because you know I didn't have any money back then. So I offered, instead of, I would take the hit, so just that I would be able to give you the money. And I said, I, you know, I worked hard just that so you get the money. This rabbi was so overtaken with emotion, he gave him a big hug and a big kiss. And he says, here's the, here's the money that you paid me. This goes back to you. I want you to take it. I want you to invest it. And he would send it to like Frankfurt, Germany. And he says, I'll give you a blessing that you'll be extremely wealthy. He, moved, he took the money, he moved to Germany with his wife and his family, and he, started, he became a merchant and he started getting into the banking business. His son, Mayor Rothschild, is where he took this banking business to a whole other level and he became extremely successful. His five, he had five children, five boys, I should say. These five children each went to a different country and they each started their own banking empire in this country. So their, their wealth grew immensely. Where did it come from? From that grandfather. That grandfather who, who bit his tongue to say, no, it wasn't me to go and just so that the other person should, have, should, should, uh, should, uh, should be able to take the money and do the right thing with the money. We see a lot of things that you could do with your money. We see a lot of things. There's one somebody that went over to a big rabbi and um, he goes over to this rabbi and this rabbi was poor beyond poor, right? He was the, um, I think it was Dov Bera of Mizrich. Mizrich, yeah, and he goes over to him and he's, he was a teacher and he took his home apart and he had a bunch of planks like cinder blocks where children sat and learned. And then after, you know, this person came to visit, he saw a bunch of cinder blocks, the rabbi said, you know, could you mind, after I finish teaching, can you come back later? He comes back later and he sees the cinder blocks were rearranged as beds now. So this guy was very shocked. This guy was by no means wealthy himself. But he goes over to this rabbi and says, Rabbi, how do you live like this? You don't have any furniture? He says, I'll, you know, I don't have so much money, but I have a couch, I have a bed, I have yada, yada, yada. So the rabbi looks at him and he says, he looks around and he says, I don't see your, where's your bed? Where's your, where's your fancy couch? Where's your, where's your furniture? And he looks at the rabbi and says, oh, I don't have a furniture here. I mean, I don't, when, I'm, when I'm traveling, I don't take my furniture. I leave my furniture in the house. The rabbi smiles and says, I, I also. I have furniture. I don't take it where I'm traveling. In this world, we're traveling. We're here temporarily. He says, I have to, just don't worry about it. I have plenty of furniture in the next world. That I'm, you know, every so often, I deposit some more furniture over there. But here's a temporary life. People go and they chase after money the entire life. They chase after money for something that's temporary, where most of the time it doesn't even go to them, it goes to their kids, or the government, or taxes, or they lose it in a bad investment. People have to realize, people have to make smart decisions on what you do with the money. Let me tell you some, now so we'll finish with this, skulot. Skulot is, is uh, um, certain things that you could do to, in, uh, that would help you get money, uh, spiritually, so in a sense. So you do spiritually and help you get money. Now there's a whole class that I have to give an example of what does skulot mean, right? It's not like a magic potion, right? That you do this, you kiss the muzuzah three times and that's it. You say a certain thing and then you're good for, for the whole day, right? There's a whole uh, understanding of skulot, but let me, we'll leave that for a different time. I'll just, I'll tell you the skulot. There is... Um, Number one is to say pitum, uh, these are skulot for wealth. How to make, you know, if you want God to give you a lot of money, certain things. You say pitum aktorat twice a day, slowly and carefully. Pitum aktorat is a certain prayer. Um, it's, a, it's a prayer on a certain uh, korbanot that we used to give, a korban that we used to give in the, in the temple. And you say that it's very apropos for, um, 
for, for wealth. So much so is that it's better even to say it on written on, on a scroll. And that's why you see sometimes people take out a scroll at the end of prayers and they read it directly from the scroll. And sometimes you see in synagogues, they have a scroll, like it's, a, it's scroll material on the wall and they read it twice a day. If you say it very carefully with a lot of concentration, it's a, uh, a merit for, for money. The next thing is when you say grace after meals. You, you ate bread and then you bench. You say the grace after meals. You say it with a lot of concentration. A very big school for money. The, actually, the number one school for money is to pray. People think it's to work hard and make a, you know. The number one thing is to pray. The more you pray, you want, you want money? Pray for, pray for money. There's a few other things that I'm, being that it's late, I'm going to have to skip. Uh, there is, there are certain, ver, there are certain uh, psalms, uh, tihilim, that are more apropos for money. Like Psalm uh, 29 or Psalm 145. They are certain, they're more apropos for money, but even though every tihilim is good, any tihilim is, is, is very good. There is another thing that's very Kabbalistic. I was thinking if I should say that or I shouldn't say that in the class or you know, I'm recording, but I'll say it. The, there is after Shabbat ends. When Shabbat ends, you put yourself where you can concentrate. You say the name Eliyahu 70 times, referring to Eliyahu Anavi, exactly 70 times. While you're saying each time Eliyahu, you concentrate on a certain name of God. You're not allowed to say this name of God. It's a certain name of God. It's Aleph Gimel Lamed Aleph. In English, it will be A-G-L-A, I guess. A-G-A-L-A, or something like that. That will be the, the pronunciation. You're not allowed to say it. When you say Eliyahu, you concentrate on this name. 70 times after Shabbat ends, but there's a condition that you can't tell anybody else that you're doing this. You can't tell anybody else that you're doing this. There is uh, uh, also dealing honestly with business. When you deal business, you deal honestly. God will see you doing the right thing with the money. He'll give you more money. This is the biggest. <laughs> the biggest is praying. But yeah, the truth is, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All of them. Uh, probably right. All of them. Yeah. That and praying on the top too. There is other concentration that you have, but it's getting late. So maybe I'll, 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 we'll, we'll leave it for a different time. But the, the other thing is, is charity. The last thing we're going to we'll speak about is charity. When you, it says in the Gemara, in Gitin, when someone sees that he doesn't have any money, he's going tight on money, what he has to do is he has to give charity. You think it doesn't make any sense. Just the opposite. When your money is tight, give charity. Give charity. Things that don't make sense, yeah. You're going to go give charity. You say, listen, I know everything is in your hand, God. He gives charity. That's a very, uh, um, uh, you know, escula for, for also for making money. Giving, giving charity. So much so, and we'll end with this, with this thought. The power of charity... The power of charity is that it could save you from death, from actual death. So much, and I'll, and I'll, uh, I'll explain it like this. There was um, Rabbi Ak it is a Gemara in Shabbat, page 156b, that says that there was one time that Rabbi Akiva, a very big, 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 big rabbi in the, Gemara, in the time of the Mishnah, I'm sorry, that he, one time in a, uh, the stargazers told him, he says, your, your daughter is going to die on her wedding day. Right? You would think somebody hears that and be like, okay, you're never getting married. But he says, no, you got to do what you got to do. God says, get married, you get married. Right? And she goes and she gets married. And the next day, he, she, she, uh, he, she sees that he's alive. And she had a pin from her here that she stuck in the wall. And when she took out the pin, she saw there was a snake attached to it. And the astrologer said that she will die in her wedding night with a snake bite, if I'm not mistaken. So the rabbi, her father, goes over and says, what did you do that made you have this merit? So she said, while everybody was dancing at my own wedding, and everybody was eating, she says, I saw a certain per poor person. And this certain poor person didn't have anything to eat. So I went and I gave him from my plate, I gave it to him. And the rabbi smiled and says, yeah, charity saves from death. If somebody was, a, was a destined to die for a certain thing, if they give charity, they, that could save them from death. That's why it says that we, we, when, it, when the time is coming soon for, for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, there's a, certain, there's a few things that you could do besides tshuva, besides uh, prayer, and chesed, there's tzaka. You give charity. Charity is such a powerful thing. Char charity is so powerful that it could save you from death. It could give you more wealth. It, there's so much that it could do. Any questions? Exactly. No questions?